Hey guys, Pastor Anthony, and I am back. All right, so we are now at to part seven of when the accuser strikes. Now, this is a really dark part of the uh, gospel because this is where the enemy is really taking root in the Pharisees. The devil has entered all of them in Jesus' name. All of his high-end demons have entered all of them. And they are just really strong and heavy in this. Um, but I don't want you to focus in on that. It's the reason why I kind of wore this uh, light-colored shirt, this blue shirt, was to show the light that is in this um, part seven. Is that, believe it or not, there's quite a bit of light. Of course, Jesus is light in it, of course. Um... But also Pilate, if you wouldn't believe it. And because Pilate actually does not want to do anything to Jesus. He, he doesn't think that he did anything wrong in Jesus' name. So he is not the one that persecuted Jesus. I mean, it was the Pharisees. He did it because he had to in Jesus' name. He was, I mean, even and even his wife told him not to do it. But he had to do it to keep his boss is happy and to keep a tumult from happening in Jesus name. Um, which doesn't take the responsibility off of him. It, he tries to cause he washes his hands of it, but it doesn't take the responsibility off of him because he still is the one who ordered it in Jesus name. He could have, he could have let him go and sacrifice the tumult in Jesus name, you know, to have the tumult happen because the Pharisees were the ones who were, who had the demons inside him, who the evil was inside of him, the ones that are supposed to be so righteous in the area, and the ones who are the teachers of the law, they were the most evil of all of them in Jesus' name. <laughs> um, whitewashed tombs, you know. Um, they were dead inside, dark, just dank, just accusing, just accuse, accuse, accuse in Jesus' name. And, and Pilate even said, I see nothing wrong with the man. So we'll, um, we'll move on. All right. So, like I said, look for the light in the story, um, not just um, the, the dark, because there's a lot of dark in Jesus' name. Um, um, so, now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he desired for a long time to see him. And this, why did he do that? Because John was in his prison, and he beheaded John, which was really dark. But he did that because of, of Herodias' daughter, or, or Herodias, actually. Um, so he was kind of forced into it as well, even though he did it in Jesus' name. Kind of like Pilate, the same thing. Um, but the reason why Herod wanted to see him was because he thought he would do miracles for him. Um, so, of course, that's what he asked Jesus. And he said, he, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracles done by him. Then he questioned him with, with many words, but he answered in him and said nothing. So, basically, what, what happened was, is Herod didn't believe that Jesus was, was greater than John <laughs> because he thought John was so great because of the words he was speaking, but the words he was speaking was coming from Jesus, um, from God, then to Jesus, then to John in Jesus' name. But he thought John was greater just because of how he spoke to him in Jesus' name because Jesus didn't say anything to him. And the chief priest and scribe stood and vehemently and accused him. So there you go. So there's the enemy, the accusers, you know, just, just, just revving up you know, Herod, you know, and his men and all that, you know, just accusing, 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 you know, um, just because they were losing their power. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Okay. Once again, Pilate labeled Jesus crazy, but not a betrayer. He just thought he was a crazy man because he believed in spirits. After he talked to him again. As Jesus refused to plead his case to him after he interrogated him, Matthew 27, 11, Mark 15, 1, Luke 23, 1, John 18, 28. This was prophesied in Psalm. Those who want to kill me, set their traps. Those who would harm me, talk of my ruin. All day long, they scheme and lie. I am like the deaf who cannot hear, like the mute who cannot speak. Psalm 38, 12. Then Pilate, when he had called all the ch together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, to, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have no fault in this man. Concerning those things in which you accuse him, no, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. 
I will therefore chastise him and release him as the man he could release for the Passover, for it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. Now, basically, he was going to chastise him to show him that, show them that he doesn't have to kill him because he'd rather chastise him than, than not than kill him in Jesus' name because he didn't think he deserved to be killed. He probably didn't think he deserved to be chastised either, but he had to keep a tumult from happening, and that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to, to pacify the the evil in the in the demons in in the Pharisees um, and the Sadducees, uh, the lawyers. I mean, all those people who are shouting and screaming, you know, um, to kill him in Jesus' name. However, they all cried out at once, saying, "Away with this man and release us to Barabbas, who had been thrown into a prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder." Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus again, called out to them, but they shouted, saying, "Crucify him!" Crucify him! They said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go to pacify the crowd. Then the soldiers of the governor did as he asked and chastised him. They took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. Okay, now this is, you know, this is not, this is not a, Pilate doing this, this is the Pilate's men. The, 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 these soldiers were, were extremely evil. He, I mean, they, the Rome had allowed these soldiers to become extremely evil, just, just caring about nothing, care about no one, actually thinking that you know, hurting people was fun. They liked seeing blood. They liked all this stuff in Jesus' name. So, I mean, they, you know, they were the really evil, you know, more evil than, than the Pharisees, or actually probably not more evil than the Pharisees, is just the fact that the Pharisees, knew that if they did those things, you know, out route and proud like that, then they would be looked down upon. These people didn't care. These people saw it as power. They wanted to do it in Jesus' name. It made it was fun for them. They laughed. They, you know, uh, hurt him as much as they possibly could. So as they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they, bow, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. When they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put his clothes on him, and led him back to Pilate. Matthew 27, 27, Mark 15, 16, Luke 23, 13, John 19, 1. Okay? Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man! Trying to pacify him again. Like, look at this. Look at this guy. Look at look at what we did to him. Is this not good enough for you? Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" Like demons they are. Pilate said to them, "You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him." The Jews answered, "We have a law, and according to all law, he ought to die, because he had made himself the son of God." Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was even more afraid. <laughs> He's like, oh, now who am I killing? What the hell is going on here? And when he got into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me now? Well, of course, why would he speak to him? His men just just hurt him in Jesus' name. Uh, it's like he can hardly, probably, hardly even speak in Jesus' name. Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has greater sin. So he saw the fact that, you know, Pilate did not want to hurt him, did not want to crucify, well, not, not want to crucify him, not want to kill him in Jesus' name. Um, his men had already hurt him. Um, but Jesus saw that, and that's why he said he has they, the ones that the Pharisees have the greater sin than the one who's that one who's uh, giving them the order in Jesus' name. But he's also saying that the, you know, he could have no power unless, my, unless his father gave it to him. Um, so what he's saying there is, is, it's, is it's my father's will for this to happen. So he's like, you know, you have the power that my father gave you in Jesus' name. Um, from then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. 
And Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement. He's still thinking, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? But in Hebrew, Gobatha, while he was sitting there, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with this man, this just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. Matthew 27, 19. All right. So his wife had a little bit of the spirit in her and she was actually getting a dream of what would happen. Um, excuse me. I'm so sorry. Um, of what would happen when what happens when you drink a Gatorade while you're while you're making these videos uh <laughs> sorry about that um yeah what was happening uh to Jesus and what's going to happen after that in Jesus name so she didn't know that you know whether he would he died or not which he was going to die because it was God's will that that was going to happen anyways now it was the preparation day of the Passover in about the sixth hour and he said to the Jews behold your king he's still trying to get him off but they cried out Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? Chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And they don't even care. They didn't care about Caesar. They wanted to power themselves. <laughs> when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather a tumult, a loud breakout of shouting, was rising, he took a water in a bowl and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood is on us and our children. So there you go. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Jewish people, the you know, you know, who didn't follow Jesus, they're saying that, that Christ's blood is on them and their children. So they curse them in Jesus' name. Those Pharisees, those Sadducees, they curse the people behind them. They're 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 People that they're gonna have, their children, their children's children, you know, their genealogy. He cursed them. They cursed them all in Jesus' name because of the evil demons that were inside them, because of the evil that was inside them, in Jesus' name. Oh man, it's hard to read. <laughs> then, despite his wife's warning, he released Barabbas to them and delivered Jesus to them to be crucified because it's what the the crowd wanted. He was pacifying the crowd to, to not have a tumult happen. Then they took him and led him away. Jesus never said one bad word or hardly any word to any of them as they were beating his body. This is prophesied in early scriptures as well in Isaiah. I clothe the heavens with darkness and make sackcloth its covering. Sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I am not rebellious. I have not turned away. I have offered my I have offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I do not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Isaiah fifty three. All right. So Jesus was made to carry his own cross to be crucified on up the hill through the town, and a great multitude of the people following him. The fault the women who also the women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us, for they do these things in the greenwood, will be done in the dry. Okay, now, he's talking about the end times here, is what he's talking about. Um, you know, he's t is, this was 2,000 years ago he's talking about this, you know, so it's like the whole, you know, you know soon thing. <laughs> um, but... He's talking about the end of times right here. He's saying, you know, blessed are the barren wombs that never born, a breast was never nursed. Basically, it's because um, you will see your children die if you, you know, bore, bore children and, and nurse children because you will see your children die in the end times because they will die um, because of the evil that's going to be here in Jesus' name. Um, then they will say, begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and the hills cover us. Basically, what he's saying is they're going to hide. They're going to want to hide under the mountains because God is going to come back. Jesus is going to, is going to come back and he's going to judge. And they're going to want to hide themselves because they are ashamed of themselves in Jesus' name. So they want the mountains to cover them in Jesus' name. All right. So Jesus was being mocked and spit on the entire way. He had been beaten mercilessly and he could barely walk. Eventually an onlooker was told to help him with it by the Roman soldiers escorting him. The onlooker identified as a Simon Assyrian, as helps Jesus up and helps him carry the cross the rest of the way. 
He helped him to the place called Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull, where his journey will end. Jesus knew his fate and exclaimed his father's will many times to his disciples and others listening to him as well. God did not save Jesus because it was not his time to be saved. It was, it was his destiny to, for this to happen to him. As he saved Abraham's son, which was not his destiny in Jesus' name. Abraham had to sacrifice his promise, his son, his only son, just like God is sacrificing his only son. On, um, on the same mountain that Jesus actually is, um, Mount Moriah, is where God told Abraham to go with his son and sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah, which is Golgotha, which is the same place outside of Jerusalem that Jerusalem didn't exist then, but it exists now at this time in Jesus's time. And it was just a mountain out in the middle of nowhere. And God said to go to this specific mountain and this, and then Jerusalem later on was built right next to this mountain and it became Golgotha, which is place of the skull, which is where, Jesus was going in Jesus' name. Um, so, it was not his destiny um, to be saved. Like, like you know, because God saved um, Abraham's son, Isaac, um, who went to the cross and who, or who actually went to them, sorry, went to the hill, the mountain, and was uh, going to be sacrificed. And the son laid himself on the, on the wood um, so he believed in God enough to, to sacrifice himself for God to let his father kill him. And then Abraham was willing to kill him for God in Jesus' name. So they both, he had obviously taught his son about who God was and how important he was in Jesus' name. And that we're supposed to sacrifice our physical life for him um, to become spirit in Jesus' name. He had no clue that God had a ram stuck in a, stuck in a bush and that, a, that an angel was going to come down and say, you know, don't sacrifice your son. I'm saving him. Okay. You know, I have this ram for you. You can sacrifice that instead in Jesus name. Um, so he had no clue about that, but he, but that happened in Jesus name. So God saved Isaac, you know, because he was willing to be sacrificed. And then Abraham was willing to sacrifice his promise, his son. He saved him in Jesus name. So Jesus knew what had to happen. He had given up his life to his father's will voluntarily. He even exclaimed this earlier. I have the authority to lay it down and authority to take up it again. Uh, sorry, and the authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father, and no one can take my life from me. I sacrificed it voluntarily. John in 8, 10, 18. So he's saying, is that you can't take my life. I don't care what you do to me. You can't take, to my, take my life. I'm spirit. I will go on. It doesn't matter in Jesus' name. He's basically saying, and the authority to take it up again. So he's saying, I have the authority to be resurrected again in Jesus' name had authority to lay his, lay his physical life down and the authority to take it up again in spirit, in Jesus' name. Um, Jesus was nailed directly through his hands and feet into the wood of the cross that he was to be crucified on. This fulfilled a prophecy in, in Psalms. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet, Psalm twenty two sixteen. 16. A plaque was nailed above his head that read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The Pharisees tried to stop Pilate from writing this. Pilate believed. And <laughs> Pilate believed, you know, so he was he was actually trying to stop it. So but so Pilate put King of the Jews on there. Jesus said, I am the King of the Jews. So Pilate exclaimed, I have written what I have written. He was hung hung along two other men who have been punished for their crimes against Rome, one on the right, and the other on the left. One mocked Jesus with the soldiers as they were crucifying him and as he hung there. Him and others said, You destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself, they mocked. They said, If you are the Son of God, then come down from that cross. The Pharisees mocked. He saved others, and yet himself he cannot save. He healed others, and yet he cannot heal himself. Referencing the townspeople of Nazareth earlier, whenever Jesus said that. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and, I, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if, we, if he will have him. Jesus then said, I am the son of God. The other rebuked his follower, his fellow robber, saying, Do you even fear God, seeing you're under, condemnation, under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, 
Surely I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. All right. It was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour, as Jesus hung on the cross, covered in blood from his injuries. The Roman soldiers played dice for his garments. This was prophesied in Psalm. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots from my garments. In Jesus' name. Psalm 22, 18, 27, Matthew 27, 32, Mark 15, 21, Luke 23, 26, John 19, 16. All right? So, what does that tell you? Jesus all it continued to exclaim, I came to fulfill prophecy. I came to fulfill what was already said to my servants in Jesus' name. And this is one of the things that was said in Jesus' name among many. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus' mother, uh, cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple who he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. John 19.25. I'm pretty sure that's John that he was talking to in Jesus' name. So basically he said, John is now your son. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. And three in the afternoon, Jesus cried in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27.45, Mark 15.34. Okay, he didn't do this because he was he was crying out to God. You know, he did this because, to fulfill prophecy. And it was prophesied in Psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? Psalm 22, 1. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay, so why did he say that? Well, because he does because he wants to these people, the Roman soldiers, anybody around, everybody around there, you know, to to, to be forgiven by his father because they know not they not know not what they do. The demons are controlling them. They're the ones that are doing it, not the people in Jesus' name. Even after they he you know was beaten mercilessly and taken to a cross and, and nailed into a cross and all that by these evil people, he was still saying, Forgive them, Father, in Jesus' name. Would you do that? Who would do that in Jesus' name? That's the reason why he's Jesus. That's the reason why he's God's son. There's the reason why we love him so much in Jesus' name. A second later, he says, I am thirsty. John 19, 28. This is prophesied in Psalm. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Psalm twenty-two, fifteen, 15. Fulfilling prophecy again. Jesus then cries out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Soldiers took a sponge and dunked it in a bucket of sour wine, stuck it on the end of a spear. They raised it to his mouth. It is finished, Jesus exclaimed. Then he gave up his spirit. Matthew 27, 46, 19, 28. Stephen, the disciple of Peter, later exclaims two of these same things as well, out of respect for Jesus, right before he gave up his spirit, being violently attacked for believing in this very act. Acts 7, 59. That was a disciple later on. Of Peter in Jesus' name. Um, so, you know, he keeps on fulfilling prophecy as he's dying, as he's doing these things in Jesus' name. Um, and it also says, you know, I commit my, my spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Not his body, his spirit. Because he had turned into spirit in Jesus' name. He was spirit. In Jesus, well, I'm sorry, not eternity. He was always spirit in Jesus' name. He never was man. <laughs> um, well, actually, he was before he started his ministry. He was man, but he was still God. He still had God's continent, still had everything, you know. But he was, um, he saw in the spirit, but then he became spirit whenever, whenever John baptized him. And God said, this is my great son. Hear him. Um, so, the sun eclipsed in the sky and the thunder rolled. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his death, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. Matthew twenty seven fifty one, Mark fifteen thirty nine, Luke twenty three forty seven. 
Therefore, because it was a preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and others who were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he, was, and he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that he may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again another scripture says, They shall look on him who they pierced. Psalm 34.20 He was declared dead. John 19.31 Jesus was fulfilling prophecy even after his body died. <laughs> his spirit, God's spirit, made these people do these things to fulfill prophecy even after Jesus' body died. His physical body died. In Jesus' name. How can you not love this man? How can you not think this guy is, is this man is God's son? It's just ridiculous that anybody doesn't think it in Jesus' name. And then blood and water came out. Okay, water was the spirit. Water represents the spirit. So blood, Jesus' blood and his spirit, you know, poured out of him in Jesus' name because he was spirit in Jesus' name. He was spirit. He wasn't just blood. He wasn't just human. He was spirit. He had blood. He had water in him, spirit in him in Jesus' name. And that's why that was done. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he, he was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command the tomb may be made secure until the third day, lest the disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Matthew 27, 62. All right. Jesus' resurrection was prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. For you will not leave my soul among the dead, or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Psalm 1610. And by Jesus himself as well, many times. Jesus claims, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Which is the reason why they crucified him. Because he said, oh, I'm going to destroy the temple. He's going to destroy our temple, our, our temple of our God. But no, he's talking about himself. When he was talking to the Pharisees, John 2.19. This is prophesied by God through Jonah here as well. God arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Jonah 1.17 So Pilate posted him in, Roman soldiers, outside the tomb to guard it to prevent his followers from stealing the body and tricking all those to believe. So the large stone was never moved after it was sealed for three days, as it was reported by the Roman soldiers at first. Matthew 27.62 all right. All right. Our Lord and Savior is now physically dead. He's in the grave in Jesus' name. But you saw the light that was in it. You saw the light in Pilate. You saw the light in Jesus. You saw the you know the light in his disciples. There's a lot of light in that, but there's a lot of darkness as well. So you have to decide who are you? Are you the accuser who are who is going to, to, to crucify Jesus and do all these horrible things to Jesus and do all these horrible things to his disciples and, and hate and steal, kill and destroy? Or are you light? Are you Jesus' side? Are you disciples' side? Are you crying? Are you, you know, begging that no, they don't do it? Are you loving? Are you compassionate towards him? Um, you know, which one are you? Like I said, I mean, you're, you're either loving or you're hating. Loving, hating, in Jesus' name. No middle ground. There's no middle ground. There is no lukewarm. There's either you're hot or you're cold, in Jesus' name. I'm Pastor Anthony. I love you guys. I will be back with part eight, which will be the resurrected Christ. And a few more things, in Jesus' name. I'll see you then. Have a blessed day.